Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another developer interview here on the Game Wisdom channel. I am, of course, Josh Spicer, and we have another great cast lineup for you tonight. My guest is a veteran of the game industry. He has been working in it for over 30 years. He has been a part of multiple studios, and he is currently the owner and lead designer at Peterson Games, who are recognizable for their hit Get tabletop game and Kickstarter Cthulhu Wars. So, please welcome to our cast tonight, Sandy Peterson. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am doing well. I am doing my best to stay cool. It's officially summer here on the East Coast. <laughs> well, you you'll get no sympathy from me because I'm in Texas. Oh. So, uh, so if you want to understand what it's like here during the summer, what you do is you go into your bathroom and turn the shower on hot. <laughs> until the whole room fills with steam. Then let 10,000 mosquitoes into your bathroom and stay there, all, stay there for three months. <laughs> I, visited my, uh, I used to visit my relatives in Las Vegas during, like, the end of oh. summer, and that was just yeah. crazy. <laughs> yes, but at least if you sweat in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. then, like, it'll evaporate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it is great to have you back on. We spoke, I think, like two, maybe two and a half years ago. It's been quite Whoa. a long trip, I think, since then. And yeah. it is great to have you back on. For those of you watching this live or recorded, if you have any questions for Sandy, let us know in the comments below, and we'll try and get to them. But uh, to begin with, since this is your first time on one of these live casts, for the people watching, could you talk a little bit about your background and what is Peterson Games? Okay, um, well, my background is that in 1980, I started designing games kind of as a side line while I was going to school. And um, so that's like 40 years ago. Uh, uh, I kind of got my established myself as a designer with the game Call of Cthulhu, the role-playing game, which was, of course, the first Lovecraft-oriented game ever made. And uh, I thought it would be an obscure cult game, but it proved to be a hit and actually spread knowledge of Lovecraft to the point that now he's kind of, you know, almost a meme. <laughs> yeah. um, I worked for Chaosium for eight years. Um, 1988, I decided it was time to uh, upgrade my salary, leaving the world of paper tabletop games, and I moved to uh, Maryland where I worked for Microprose Software. I worked on several projects there, uh, role you know, digital games. Uh, from Microsoft, I went to uh, Texas to id Software where I was involved with uh, Doom, Doom 2, Quake, the early id uh, uh, Studios games. Um, from there... I went to Ensemble Studio, still digital, where I did more digital games, uh, uh, the Age of Empires series, uh, um, Halo War, stuff like that. From there, I taught school for two years about how to develop games at uh, Southern Methodist University. So uh, there was a small window of people that got to have me teach them directly, for better or worse, how to develop digital games. And then in 19, or sorry, 2013, let's get in the right century here, um, <laughs> I founded Peterson Games, which kicked off with, as you mentioned, the Cthulhu Wars game, which is a uh, quite a good success for me. And then, and from then on, it's been uh, Peterson Games right along. We Our most recent thing we just did was uh, Dinosaur 1944, which is a board game about dinosaurs versus army men. <laughs> and uh, we have a... Uh, it's uh, been quite a ride. It certainly has. And I just want to say, like, your background, like, your wall of games certainly beats my background. I think you win <laughs> in terms of the impressive background. Here, I'll, do, I'll do the camera scan. You can see all the stuff. Uh, oh, the pile of boxes there is a bunch of CDs my wife snuck out of the... <laughs> out of the uh, as, my, as my assistant uh, game designer and son... Um, <laughs> Uh, Lincoln, and then there's more games over here, and nice. there's more games, and it kind of goes on forever. The whole house is full of games, and none of those <laughs> games visible there are, are actually games that I uh, uh, that I publish because I don't. Have, they aren't in my regular game library. I, I have I have a section for them too, um, and 
you you have yeah. uh, beaten me, sir. You have beaten me in terms I've of been doing it longer. That's all. Is there's no <laughs> there's no virtue extra virtue I have you don't have. When, when you're 64, you may have twice as many as me. Who knows, right? And my family will allow me to display all my games on the walls. Well, there's that. <laughs> I do have the edge that I can say, well, Wendy, this is professional development. I have to buy this game. And, Someday uh, I can say that to people. Yeah, I have to just show all my thousands of games. <laughs> I could probably build a I house have, eventually. I have to have to them. Yeah. You know, how can I possibly design my next game unless I'm able to look up my copy of Through the Ages or Hol <laughs> Hoplomachus? You know, they've got to be there for me to... Uh, or Sac Noir. <laughs> that might be one of the best games on the shelf. It's just a bag of wooden pieces. <laughs> But as you said, it has definitely been a very long journey in terms of your route through the game industry and through tabletop. So I guess as a kind of a first question I want to ask you, as like dipping your, your or uh, dipping your hands in both the tabletop and the digital space, have you found like you prefer or you like one style over the other? Um for designing the games? Yes. Oh, I greatly prefer designing uh, tabletop games over digital games. And the reason is twofold. The first part of the reason is that it takes a really long time to do a digital game. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Did uh, Sandy freeze? Uh-oh, are we still alive? <laughs> Uh-oh. Did the Cthulhu come and stop us? I have to commit to this what? Uh, I'm sorry, Sandy, you kind of froze for like, oh, you froze again for like the last uh, minute. <laughs> oh, I'm not frozen on mine. I don't know what to say. Um, uh, let's see. If it well, happens again... Go back. Oh, yeah, you're cutting out. Let me uh, let me restart the Discord call and we'll see that... Uh, fixes anything. If you can still hear me. I'm hoping we're alive, Malwinius. <laughs> oh, are you still there? Alright. Let me uh, disconnect. Let me join the call again. Let me try it again. Okay, so... Uh... Are you there, Sandy? Uh oh. Test. Oh. I left and then joined and he left. Okay, wait, I think we're getting back. Can you hear me, Sandy? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Let me. Uh, uh, one second. I'm going to have to re. Uh, while I'm uh, setting back up the window again, if you could um, uh, feel free to. I guess it repeat what you were saying before we had all those issues. Uh -oh. Okay, so, so there's two reasons that I prefer doing tabletop board games over digital games. Mm -hmm. And the first reason is that it takes much longer to do a digital game. T I mean, uh, typically it takes a uh, year and a half, two years to make a digital game. Um, now, it may take that long for a tabletop game to come out as well, but I'm typically, but I'm usually doing more than one digital game at a time. In fact, I'm always doing more than one at a time. So I have three or four games I'm working on in that year and a half, whereas in a digital game, I'm doing one game for a year and a half, and that's it. So it's so it's so there's more variety on tabletop. The second reason is that when I'm doing a digital game, there's like a team of, of 10 or 15 or 25 or 75 or 100 people that you're working with, and thus, your creative input is diminished, even if you're the lead designer, like I often am. You're, it's diminished by that amount. And also, you have to wait for other people. You can't get instant uh, feedback. If you say, oh, I need to try this change, you have to wait for someone to put up the new build, and then test the new build, and then go. It's like, there's, it feels like pushing a rope. So uh, now, of course, the good side is that they make fabulously more money. But, uh, <laughs> but that, but, that's not a reason to like doing them. It's just a reason to do them. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, uh, I wanted to ask you about, one of my uh, friends who couldn't make it to the live talk, and he also wanted to bring this up, is kind mm -hmm. of how much tabletop design has changed 
in the past 40 years. Again, you got started in the tabletop side, moved to digital, and then you're back at tabletop. I guess, from your perspective, how has that market, or just like the general design of tabletop, there was, has evolved? There's been, there's been two titanic changes in the tabletop world since I started doing those kind of games back in 1980. And the first was... Uh, the development of the um, what we sometimes call the Euro games in the in the 90s, uh, where G basically Germany evolved a board game culture, and uh, instead of like board games in America were traditionally tedious. It was like Monopoly, yeah. you know, or Stratego. They were like lame. They were fidgety. They really weren't that fun. And but Germany suddenly had these games. Uh, the first one usually did come across the Settlers of Catan, but there was others after that that you, you could play in an hour and a half or two hours that were fun, that had a real ending, unlike Monopoly, which always ends <laughs> with the table flip. And, uh, and these just took uh, the board game world by storm. Wow, board games that grown-ups can play that are fun. You know, I got a bunch on my shelf here. So that was, you know, a lot of the old classics of board games to think about are actually really terrible games, like it mentioned, you know, Stratego. So <laughs> that was the first change fun games, and this really energized the, the game market. Even the old school American type, Ameritrash type games like Twilight Imperium or, uh, or, or, or Board War games responded to this becoming more fun, punchier, better art. So that was the first, that was the first big change. The second change was the advent of crowdfunding, which made it possible for someone, for example, me, to do a game without having to get a publisher to buy into it. Cthulhu Wars could never have existed before crowdfunding. No publisher would would bet his uh, shirt on a $200 game full of giant oversized figures. That would just not fly at all. Now, that you could argue that's a bad thing, and some people have. For me, it wasn't. But, but that is a big change. So, the, so crowdfunding, letting everyone do their own games, and... Uh, and the advent of the Euro games, those are really, really big changes in board games. Yeah. And both I definitely want to talk with you about here. Like, as you said, like, growing up playing tail, like, my family, we we are, like, very little in terms of tabletop. Again, you mentioned Monopoly. That was kind of our, mm -hmm. that was our game night, and usually never, it, yeah. again, any of people just going, right? yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like... It was like, it ended like, does anyone want to still want to play this game? No? Okay, let's pack no, it up. We're no. done here. <laughs> exactly. No one ever really ends Monopoly, because at the point where someone's going to win, yeah, well, you know, I don't need to condemn Monopoly. It, was, it is what it is. It, mm -hmm. it's, it set the stage for games uh, to exist further. It was like an embryonic uh, game in embryo. Yeah. It and, didn't come out right. And that evolution of tabletop design is such a fascinating aspect. For my longtime fans or the new people watching, my background has been predominantly on the digital side. I never really had chance, just because of the fact that there weren't a lot of people around here to play tabletop games with, so that side of the market has been relatively unknown to me. And my friend uh, Thorne was on, he's the one who started getting me into some of the tabletop games with a tabletop simulator. And I played a few of the games through there, and one of the things that I noticed, like, as a predominantly a video game player, and like you said, is just how much more involved tabletop games have gotten. And, like, from someone from the outside, when you say tabletop games, again, they'll think Monopoly, Sorry, Candyland, any of those titles. But mm -hmm. tabletop design has really come into its own and it really has become almost as varied and as diverse as what we see like video game designers or digital games have done. Well, it, I would argue that it's more diverse, actually. Mm -hmm. Video game designs have a tendency, and I think it's because there's a lot of money in them, mm -hmm. to go into the same, dip in the same well again and again, right? And, and do the right genre. It's only occasionally that a designer is able to break free of that. that. Like Shigeru Miyamoto did with Pikmin. He like. I, you know, shattered the idea of what a Nintendo game should be and did this crazy, like, gardening game. You know, occasionally one of those things comes out. But, and of course, Steam actually allows that, is allowing that to come out more. It's almost like the equivalent of the, uh, of the crowdfunding thing for uh, board games. Yeah. You see, some, you see some wacky stuff on Steam that probably would not have flown to the publisher, you know? Definitely. And, like, for myself, with all the indie games that I've played lately, that is definitely true. The independent space has just become 
pretty much like the source of so many unique and interesting titles. I don't know if yeah, you saw... Yeah, you used to have to get uh, Sony to approve it. Now you can do My Time at Porsche or, you know, Baba Is You or, you know, uh, Slay the Spire, crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And I got the... uh, Graveyard Keeper. Nobody would ever publish Graveyard Keeper, right? Oh, yes. Witch burning and all kinds of horrible things. But, Mm -hmm. sorry, I'm on a rant, so I will shut up. (laughs) That's all right. I mean, I just got the uh, itch bundle that they did for uh, raising funding for Black Lives Matter and so on. They don't. Uh, they submitted like over like fifteen hundred different projects, and I mean the stuff that's in there. Like as you said, none of that would ever be touched by a mainstream publisher or any publisher with like a ten foot pole. Yep. But but they're existing now and they're successful. And part of that is because the well, you know, I worked for the man for almost all my career, and I'm not complaining. The man was good to me. He gave me a good salary. I had health care. You know, um, but. One of the effects of that is that during the entire time that I worked, um, the where I wasn't my own boss, which started in 2013, once in that 33 years of game design did I get to pick my own subject for the for a game. It was always some guy above me, you know, with a suit quite often who would pick the name of the game, pick the game. I'm not begrudging him that he 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 shelled out the money he gets to pick. But it's not. But it's also not necessarily the case that those guys have the best idea of what would be the funnest game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that I think has been the motivation for a lot of developers, especially the last ten years, to go from a major company to starting their own indie studio and having that freedom to say, "I want to make this game," and there's nobody over my shoulder saying, "No, you can't do that." Mm-hmm. Well, a kinder way of putting it is not that they are saying no, but they're they're saying yes to this game. Mm-hmm. They're giving you what you need to make this game that they want you to do. Mm-hmm. And you know, and and like I said, I mean, why should they pay you to do a game you want to do when they're paying for you, right? Yeah. But that's why you. That's why. And right or wrong, it means well, I'll just go make my own game with Steam. I don't have to have that guy give me the money for it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That's the. Uh, and that's kind of what crowdfunding did for board games. Um, Definitely, nobody would have, right? So, and that's I think that was one of the more like interesting things to watch because when kind of the Kickstarter bubble first happened, I think that was 2012, 2014, somewhere around there with Double Fine. In, I think in twenty twelve there was like three million dollars mm-hmm. in board games on Kickstarter, and then twenty thirteen there was fifty one million. Yeah. Now it's the biggest thing. It's been the biggest thing for you know d- years now, and yeah. uh, and interestingly, the uh, board games usually fund, and the digital games usually don't. Yeah, and that's the that was the interesting thing that I wanted to bring up with you, because like I said, like when like the Kickstarter bubble first happened, a lot of people felt this is going to be the next wave for video games. You know, video yeah. games were going to succeed. We're going to do all this crowdfunding. It was always going to work. And then that kind of bubble burst. I think that was like 2016, maybe 2017, somewhere around there. Like that just dried. It may not completely dry it up, but it became a thousand times harder. And then all of a sudden, like at least from like my from outside the tabletop market, we started to get these reports about you know tabletop game earns like 30 million. Another tabletop game gets super successful, and it really like the tabletop industry just really blew up around crowdfunding. Yeah, and uh, and the digital game did not, and I think it's justified because um, a lot of obviously most tabletop games aren't getting ten million dollars, right? But mm-hmm. for example, I just did a campaign for uh, my dinosaurs, dinosaur nineteen forty four game, uh, which is dinosaurs versus army men tabletop game with dinosaurs and army men. And uh, this game made $187,000, I think, on Kickstarter. And that's plenty for me to make that game as a board game. But that would be pathetically small yeah. for a digital game. You could, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you could fund maybe four months of the digital game with that if you have a really small team. So, so I think people figured out that the digital games, even if a digital game got like a million bucks or two million bucks on, 
on on Kickstarter or 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 Indiegogo or some other platform, that wasn't nearly enough to actually fund a digital game. At least if you're educated, you know that. And the other problem was that they started seeing these digital games that were fu that had funded failing, that they wouldn't come through. People said, well, we don't have enough, we can't do it. Our team changed. And I think it's because, like I said, digital games take a really long time to do. And during that time, your, t your team can change. You could, what, if, what happens if your uh, uh, head programmer um, quits, right? Yeah. Or gets another job? Then, like, you got to find a new one or do whatever you have. And so I think that's what's happening. People saw these digital games failing on, on crowdfunding and, uh, and are shy. And they saw the, the mm -hmm. board games, which cost a lot less to make, generally succeeding and they became more trusted. I know that it would be tough for me to back a digital game on Kickstarter. Mm. And I've invested in digital games and supported them, but not on a crowdfunding platform. I mean, I, I guess yeah. I designed them for 25 years. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I've obviously made my bones in digital games. But And I think that's a really good point there. And it's something I think a lot of developers don't want to hear, but it's unfortunately that kind of situation where... It's hard to trust somebody saying, here's my crazy idea that I just developed in, you know, two, three months. Give me $70,000, and I may have something in the next two to three years. And who knows? Yeah, but is 70000 Yeah, but there it is. Is $70,000 actually enough to do a, bo a board game in, in three years? Well, obviously not. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, a computer a big, game. Yeah. Right, because $70,000 won't even pay for your lead guy for one year, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, I, I mean, if they, maybe they would show, we're going to do it, and we have a whole team together that can do this, and this funding is going to be enough for us to do this for this long, and we've already solved the problems we're doing. But then if you're, in the, if you're that well set up and that good to go, then maybe Kickstarter isn't your platform, and you should be going looking for other sources of income for investors, you know, because you're, not, you're actually now a real going thing. Um, mm -hmm. Like like my own company has we aren't like running away from Kickstarter or anything, but and it's been good to us. But we're starting to now publish games that are not crowdfunded. We just like publish them straight and go right to market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think again, like the issue when it comes to these kinds of games is that, as you said, the beauty about a tabletop game is that you can show somebody very quickly, you know what you kind of have in mind. Like obviously you can't have yeah. every figurine you you want like ready during the Kickstarter, but you can sit somebody down, or you can show a paper prototype very easily of a tabletop game. Now and, now yeah, in fact and in fact my company has moved to the position that we have the whole game designed before we go onto the platform to crowdfund. Mm -hmm. And we've all now the figures aren't plastic, they're just three D models. But we can show those 3D models, and they're finished. Yeah. That wasn't the case when you did Cthulhu Wars originally, but it is now. Dinosaur Night and World of War, you can see all the figures. You can play the game. Um, some of our games we had available on Tabletop Simulator. You could play our game before it was published. You know, And you can't do that with a digital game. You can't finish it before it comes out. It just costs too much to do. And so all you can show is a little you know, animation yeah. or a video. And, that... and even a really good video, like uh, what was that? Uh, what was what was that fabled game? The uh, uh, Unreal, the uh, the ones, the Alien Skies, or what? You know what I'm talking about? That was going to be the best thing ever for for an open based space exploration game, and then it proved to all be kind of a sham. No, the only one I'm thinking of is like Star Citizen, but that one is, I hope, still being made. It's still <laughs> pulling No off. Man's Sky, that's what it was. No Man's Sky. Yeah. And no now Man's Sky. Remember that was... That, I mean, they're, they're trying to now make make it be what it was purported to be, mm -hmm. right? But it, certainly, when it first became available, it wasn't what the videos were saying it was. Yeah. No Man's Sky, that's the one I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. And again, when you're trying to pitch somebody a Kickstarter video game... That mm -hmm. can change dramatically, as anyone who's worked on a game would certainly attest. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess like exactly, you can cut big things. Often, you just simply have to cut huge things out of your video game. I mean, I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the board game, you hardly ever have to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's in there, and and of course now, of course, the 
the backers are now super sensitive to that kind of thing. So if you say, for example, well, I think we're going to make this out of two millimeter cardboard instead of three millimeter cardboard, it suddenly turns out that they claim that you're trying to make it out of pizza boxes and everything is terrible. So <laughs> you, have to, <laughs> you have to be very communicative with the uh, your, your market. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that we were kind of talking about before we started the cast about kind of the logistics of having like these physical tabletop games, I guess, how has that, like, has that changed at all or has changed majorly over like the last 10, 15 years? Um, I can't speak for the last 10 or 15 years because I've only been doing tabletop games since 2013. Okay. Um, but when I did tabletop games such as the original Arkham Horror back in the 80s, it was pretty different from now. I mean, we printed our games like in the United States. Um, uh, we were unable to make cool card, cool plastic figures very easily, so games didn't have those. You had pawns. Uh, now, almost practically every game is made in uh, not every game, but a lot of games are made. Ninety percent are made in China with uh, uh, um, PVC uh, figures that are often very detailed and high quality. Um, and so they had to be shipped overseas to like the whole world. So it used to be you'd have a game company and you sold your games just in England, or you'd sell your games just in Australia or just in America. Now all the games are everywhere, and uh, we sell games to you know Malaya and South Africa and Siberia and all kinds of crazy places. Um, plus the games are uh, uh, made by these, like I said, these factories in China where I've, I've gone to see the factories and investigate them, and they're they're pretty entertaining. There's always a uh, a big shrine to the war god in the foyer of the factories with like some oranges or grapefruits for him to eat. I asked them about that. I said, "Why is the war god here?" And they said, "Well, he's the god of money too." So I, I said, "Okay." <laughs> of course, he is. <laughs> I mean, I would want I would want the god of money to bless my factory. So why not, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and with kind of like the tabletop design. I was looking at the Kickstarter for Dinosaur 1944. I guess yes. one thing that I, I want to ask you about, again, with kind of the difference between digital and tabletop games, how long mm-hmm. does it normally take you to kind of conceive, like, your next game? Like, from, a, like, a tabletop perspective. Well, the the dark secret for all games and having... And you got to understand that my only full-time job as an adult has been a game designer, so I don't really know any other world. Mm-hmm. Um, but the dark secret is that it's not that hard to come up with ideas for games. If I was to take you, Josh, and lock you in a closet and say, here is the internet and a bunch of books, and you can't leave this closet for six weeks. We'll, we'll sneak ramen noodles under the, floor, under the door so you can eat. <laughs> in six weeks, we want to see how many game ideas you have in six weeks. And you would probably have hundreds by then, mm-hmm. just sitting there doing just that in a vacuum. The hard part isn't coming up with the idea, it's actually turning that great idea into a thing. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's it, that's the rub. And that's the same thing when it comes to digital video games. Everybody can think that's of... the same thing, yep. I actually came yep. up with a tabletop game idea a few years ago based off of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Ooh, build game. your own monster. That'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did a game. I didn't design the game, but I published a game a little like that called Dysonstein, mm-hmm. where you actually had dice that were body parts, and you'd roll them, and then you'd have to assemble them to make your monster. Nice. So oh. it's probably not as good as your game, but uh, <laughs> it was. You know, we published it, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it had a great name. Dysonstein is a fabulous name. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and. Uh, with uh, Dinosaur 1944, I'm just looking at the Kickstarter as we've been talking. So, uh-huh. when did the actual campaign wrap up for it? The campaign wrapped up... Um, I'm trying to remember the exact date. It was, it was only up for for uh, the, the 13 days. Okay. Um, so, or 11 days, actually. So, we started in... Uh, So it, it it was it was done before, just before the end of uh, of June. I probably look it up if I look on the calendar. Sorry, I don't remember it offhand. <laughs> I think I'd know my own project. We ended on the twenty sixth of June, 
uh, and went for a week and a half. So that was what we did. We were going. We're doing shorter campaigns now. We think that gets the idea across and speeds up the process for everyone. So yeah, there was eleven days, and that eleven days we made uh, one hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. Well, actually less because Kickstarter gets a cut and the credit card companies get a cut and <laughs> various cuts. But we get the lion's share of that. And um, you probably had more to ask than just like how long the campaign was, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I guess another thing that I found very interesting is that looking at kind of the description for the game, let me pull this back up really fast. Where did I just see it? Here it is. That you have the age range set ages 14 and up. And I know, well, obviously with video games, there's always that challenge of knowing like who your market is or knowing the age range. With the well, let me give you a, let me give you a fun fact about the age range. Mm-hmm. Okay, the age range is really, really often 14 and up because the EU has special extra restrictions mm. if a game is meant for children of 13 or less, mm. where they have to test every part of your project <laughs> to make sure it doesn't have mercury or, or, or cyanide or some poison in it. Now, obviously, the cardboard and PVC of my game has no mercury or cyanide in it, but it takes... You have to go through the EU bureaucracy and take longer to have it double checked if, you know, uh, if you says you're not for 14. So a lot of games are 14 to avoid having to do that. <laughs> a, tw- a 10 or 11 year old can play Dinosaur 44, but the official word is, for- is 14 years old, so that, you know, to avoid a little bureaucracy. Another restriction is if it's uh, for ages, uh, it, it, you have to have three or more if there's anything that a baby can choke on, because, I mean, that just makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. So so the age picked... So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the age that is picked for a game is not always based on who can actually play it, but on other considerations that have nothing to do with that. All right. I think uh, for the people watching, we need to worry about. We hopefully we don't have to worry about video games having cyanide attached to them. That may be the next yeah, well, loot box. I, I don't think video games are actually <laughs> tested that way. The the, the the law lets them get by. So uh, so so your kids can choke on video game uh, cartridges all they want. It's not a problem. There we go. <laughs> And I guess yeah, we never had to worry about that with our video games. Yeah. And there, the, the video game, the video gamers are more worried about the um, basically whether it's you know. PG or R rated, um, which I will admit that when I was doing the games back in the day, we never worried about that because we were doing mass market huge games. So, uh, and it, and it's, I mean, I guess that's not true. I did Doom, which was like considered so bad that uh, <laughs> Tipper Gore and Joe Lieberman waived copies of it in Congress and condemned me and my company. So that was well, not me by name, but my company. Oh yeah. So that was really bad, I guess. And then I did uh, the the Ensemble Studio, the Age of Empires series, which no one thought were gory, even though literally thousands of people yeah. were being told in these games. But, you know, it was it was uh, historical, so it wasn't gore. <laughs> yep. Always that fun thing when it comes to how violence is depicted in these games. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, when, we did, uh, when we did Doom for n- n- uh, Nintendo on the Nintendo 64, um... We converted it, and they said, "What? You're shooting dogs in this game?" And we said, "Yeah, we, we shoot Nazis too." He says, "You can't shoot dogs. That's bad." So we had to replace the dog sprites with giant rats. It was okay to shoot rats, not dogs. But interestingly, it was okay to shoot the people. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, we we just basically when when the government or a bigger publisher would have a hoop to jump through, we would jump through the hoop without asking if it made sense because it never did. Yeah. <laughs> and that's always been like again like that crazy thing when it comes to the video game industry or just like the game industry in general about you know what people will allow I remember seeing a kickstarter for a tabletop game it was like very like explicit figurines like very mature oh yeah yeah you're thinking about kingdom death monster yeah all the naked ladies yes and like it didn't seem like anyone was like batting an eye at that. Like it was just okay. <laughs> it's I guess I guess the age range was the right one. <laughs> Do not offend people. Um, Hopefully, it wasn't three and up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, well, that game comes on sprues, so there is absolutely a choking hazard for little kids. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, in fact, the guy that did that game, uh, Adam uh, Poots, we uh, 
our company helped him get his first thing shipped because he had no idea how much shipping would cost or how to do it, and we had a slight handle on that. Not much. His actually his Kickstarter was before ours, but he took so long to get his done that ours were shipping before his. So we uh, we gave him a hand. So we are officially friends of the Kingdom Death Monster, even though we do not have uh, naked ladies in our games. <laughs> our dinosaurs are without clothes, though. So yeah. <laughs> there's that. So but we have some historical justification for it. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you about when it comes to the tabletop games, I know that's something that you, you, you've done with Cthulhu Wars, and it seems like something that's going to be in Dinosaur, is the idea of having like expansions and additional content like prepared or set up for your games. And I guess when we, it's always been that very weird thing when we talk about digital games with how people view like DLC, expansions, mm -hmm. and things like that. How does like the tabletop market like? What is their general perception about seeing games that have like multiple expansions well, and updates? For me, it is doing expansions has been a part of my uh, games since the very beginning in 1981. Uh, the Call of Cthulhu, the role playing game, comes out the next year. We're publishing a campaign to to play in that in the Call of Cthulhu game. Uh, and then we publish more. We can publish multiple campaigns every year, and we found that the campaigns, um, well, the campaigns didn't individually outsell Call of Cthulhu, but but aggregately they did, and they were cheaper to make. When I did computer games, uh, for example, when I did the, the Age of uh, uh, Empires game, I was I, I said we should do an expansion for this. Let's add Rome to Age of Empires. How cool is that? Who doesn't want to be Rome? And and Microsoft came down on us and said, oh, you can't do that. Nobody will buy an expansion for a digital game. It's completely unthinkable. <laughs> so so we did it anyway. And then we said, here it is. You can publish this if you want. So the, so the begrudging of the publish it. And it caught, of course, the cost of the of the Rise of Rome expansion was like 10% of the core game. And it sold 35% as much, which, means, which meant it was like this huge moneymaker for Microsoft. And then when it came time to the next game, which was Age of Empires, the Age of Kings, then they came to us and says, "We have learned that you have to do an expansion for it." And we said, "Yeah, you learned that from us." So we're of course, and then we didn't. We did the conquerors, you know. And so I did those expansions, and again, they were less. They were quicker to do. They were fun. They expanded on the game. They usually hit the market just about the right time when people are maybe not getting sick of the core game, but they're looking for something more. And so with Cthulhu Wars and my board games, I may have gone over the top a little bit because there's like 50 expansions to Cthulhu Wars. <laughs> But uh, but it's become like an accepted, exciting thing of the game. It, 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 what, and one of the things it means for the game player, which I think is a positive, is that they can get into the game, just the core game, right, and fairly inexpensively, okay, I mean, whatever the core game costs. I think it's seventy nine dollars for Dynasty Forty Four. That might seem like a lot, but it's not for a board game. And so they can play it, and if they really like it, you know, they can get more stuff to make it even better and become like a fan. And if the, and if they like the game but they aren't but it's only going to be in their rota once every 2 or 3 months, then they don't need to get that extra stuff cuz the game is going to be fresh for as long as they play it. You know, so so you kind of have the best of all the worlds. Another advantage financially for us with the expansions is that a lot of people will pick up the expansions online often from our website or from Amazon and so they don't uh and so we actually get a bigger share of the money in that case. So, <laughs> a, but uh, whereas, but uh, so the core game, and then of course that's the principle we had with uh, when I did Doom, back in the day, where we called it Heroinware, where you got the first adventure <laughs> free, then you had to pay for the rest. It was kind of like that with with Cthulhu Wars or Planet Apocalypse. You get the first; it's more than the first adventure. You have plenty of gameplay in the core game, but then oh, I got just had one faction, and I'll be so much more. Uh, stuff I can do, so many more combinatorics, you know, and then, and then of course you have the crazy people that uh, must own every single bit of the game. That oh, are the, yes. uh, yeah. So the, and those are like my favorite fans. <laughs> so I mean, I'm kind of one of them myself, and I know people that won't buy a game unless they think they can get everything. So that's that's the challenge. Yeah, but but I think I'm. I think it's not, yeah, it's not just greed. It's like anyway. Uh, I think I'm that way too with like a lot of games. Like when I hear that there's something that's not available or it's missing, it just I think really puts a damper 
on knowing that, you know, this game is only 75% complete or 93% complete. Oh, I know. I, I own uh, the, the old Avalon Hill board game uh, um, uh, Squad Leader, and I cannot get the Armies of Oblivion expansion. They ship, they publish like a thousand of them, and they're all in the hands of collectors. And so I have everything for that game except for that expansion. So, <laughs> so my life is incomplete. Yeah. But, uh, with with that, enti- <laughs> with the entire yeah. wall of games behind you, it's still. I know, isn't that crazy? Right, it makes no sense. But if, <laughs> but if we were all being like super rationalist machines, we would probably not have any games, and we yeah. wouldn't be having the talk. So it's just as well that we're not. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that now, like for the digital side of things, consumers expect there to be future expansions and content for their games yeah. now. Well, the advent of DLC, which. Mm. I will admit, kind of came on after my time mm-hmm. of, in digital games. I kind of left actively publishing in 2009. I mean, then I taught for a couple of years, but that's not the same. Uh, so we didn't really di- DLC wasn't really a thing then. And uh, but that I mean, you can it's obviously there's the dark side to it, but the bright side to it is that I can sit there play the game and suddenly said, I want my character to ride a turtle, and then you push a button and now you're riding a turtle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I guess the dark side is that you have to pay for the turtle, and the fact is that um, the turtle costs the company precisely zero dollars to give you because, yeah. you know, it's just a digital <laughs> bunch of light and pixels. Mm-hmm. And of course, like the big difference, of course, when we talk about a tabletop expansion, is that there is a lot more that goes into designing and printing oh, yeah. a new expansion than it is for a video right. game. All right, it's actually, it's actually of worth, and you're getting, I mean, if you get our our, our, our dinosaur expansion, you're going to get an, an Ankylosaurus figure, 28 millimeter scale, that you can hold in your hands, and and that your, uh, your toddler can whack the cat over the head with. You know, how cool <laughs> is that? You don't get that when you're riding a turtle in World of Warcraft. No, definitely not. <laughs> and one thing that I always find interesting about kind of how much like the tabletop market and digital markets have really like changed or have really like diverged from each other is that we're kind of seeing things like get back together with the fact that we're seeing more digital options for tabletop games. I bought, yeah. I think it was a bundle, I forget, it was like a major tabletop game. They did like bundles for their games a few months well, ago. Golem Arcana, where you can't play this this tabletop collectible figure game unless you have the app on your phone. Hmm. Which is free, of course. So, yeah. you know, it's not like it's hard to get. Who doesn't have a phone now, right? But yeah, Gollum Arcana does that, and there's other games like that. And it's, I think it's kind of a cool thing. Um, yeah. We just did a game, we just published a game ourselves called uh, Two Minute Dino Deal, and it kind of does that in the sense that to play the game, you must have your phone and you must put the timer on for two mm-hmm. minutes. And that, I mean, that's, that's the extent to which we use the phone, but hey, you know. And now people are, I know there's people that are putting up helpful things for Cthulhu Wars and our other games digitally on the computer or on the phone that people can access. We have no problem with that. I mean, we're not selling them. We're just, like, yeah. supporting their existence. And I think, like, for somebody like me, again, who doesn't have access to the, vis- the physical space and the people nearby to do these games, that this is a very great alternative to get more people exposed to it. Oh, you're talking about the, like, tabletop simulator now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a... Uh, I be- because now that with, 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 with the virus keeping me to my house... Yeah. And my entire team won't let me go outside because they say you're 64 years old. Stay away from the sick people. <laughs> so, I, so I'm like, you know, isolated here, quarantined. Um, I'm able to play test my my new game, Starship Captain, on Table Simulator. I made my son that you saw earlier like put together a version of it, and so we, I, you know, I'll go out and play it, and our spaceships will fight, and I'll have a full play test, and I won't have to be there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can sit here without any pants on and just watch the play test. That came out wrong, but you know, <laughs> you know the principle, right? Yes, we don't have to. There, it's casual. Fr- it's endless casual Friday now. Endless casual Friday, yes. <laughs> now, and all, and all the stores, all the restaurants are now doing uh, delivery, or 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 pickup at worst. You know, you can get DoorDash or whatever, and so I can sit here and say it's it's sushi day, and then Basil Cafe sends over some sushi. <laughs> And like I, like a a extra, an introvert's dream come true. Sadly, I, I'm not so much of an introvert, but exactly, I'm glad that someone's dreams are coming true. 
And just as a quick time check, we are about 50 minutes in. I want to see if you're if you're still good in terms of time or anything along those lines. If I am what? If you're still good in terms of time, like do we? Uh... I'm still good in terms of time. Okay. I have I have an I have a uh, a play test that I've been threatened with having to do that I would rather slack off and not start. So uh, <laughs> so you are you are freeing me from the need of that. Uh, that responsibility. All right. And for the chat watching, again, if you have any questions for Sandy about tabletop design or any of his games, feel free or to leave them. Design, yeah, anything, yeah. right? Definitely leave them in the comments. And one thing that I always find fascinating about the tabletop side compared to digital is the kind of like figuring out the player requirements for these kinds of games. You know, how many people are going to be able to sit and play your game at any, you know, for, you know, a normal setting, for an expanded setting, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. I, I just got a, a, a relevant question on um, the Dinosaur 1944 campaign, actually, in the comment column where the guy said, okay, if I have eight people playing this game, which you can do in the mm -hmm. game, how big of a, of a footprint does this have on my table? <laughs> So I, I had to fess up and say, well, it's probably around five foot by three foot. So you, you can't play it on a card table. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to have a big dinner table to do it. Uh, it takes space. And a lot of my games especially seem to take the space, not so much because the map's big, but because they have the, you have the figures that are waiting off the board to come on. Mm -hmm. Usually you have some kind of like display or control panel that you rule your things with. So you have your display for all eight people, then you have the map, then you have the figures, then you have the figure pools, then you have then someone's always trying to get out a copy of the rules to look up something. So it you know, it keeps spreading larger and larger and in a way that digital games that just sit under take zero space. How convenient is that? Yep, definitely. And On the other hand, there is there is a certain the panoply of all the cool things is pretty neat. There's if you if you've looked up Cthulhu Wars online, you'll see there's many people that take photographs of the game in full session <laughs> with all the stuff because it's so spectacular. You know, there's there's and uh, I'm firmly with uh, with uh, Chris Roberts in that debate where uh, where I think that the, the 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 look and the feel and the sound and the and the 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 just the spectacle of a game is part of the fun. Yeah. And that's definitely one thing I think tabletop does have an advantage over when it comes to digital. Again, with the the physicality of it. I remember yeah. when we did. I think it was the second time I spoke with. Uh, I think I spoke with your son or uh, somebody else at Pearson Games. I was during the one of the Cthulhu Wars Kickstarter, and they mm -hmm. were showing me a. You know, it's like a five inch or like these like massive figurines. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're huge. They're, uh, in fact, here, let me show you the biggest, some of, some of the biggest ones I've got. <laughs> so, so this is the Hellgate from Planet Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's pretty big. Yeah. You know, the gate's big enough for a 28 millimeter figure to fit through if you played a lot of D&D. But then recently, or uh, last year, we did the... Uh, the Cthulhu Harbinger, and we made this figure. Nice. And we kind of made this big as a as sort of half a joke, but it's nonetheless a figure that is in the game. I mean, it's big enough to to do a murder with, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, not all the figures are this big, thank heavens, but there's some pretty big figures, and when you take one of these five or six inch figures, and you glom it down on the table, yeah. and say, I have just summoned Cthulhu, and here he <laughs> is, you know, everyone's looking at that. You know, and when you move him on the table and he goes thump, then there's a certain power to that that uh, that you don't get with a with the digital game. <laughs> I just love the phrase. I just summon Cthulhu. <laughs> you should be able to <laughs> say that in any game. <laughs> <laughs> you get to say it in at least one of my games. <laughs> Actually, a bunch of my games. Uh, in fact, my first game, Call of Cthulhu. Wait, maybe you don't say you summon Cthulhu, but Cthulhu gets summoned or can get summoned. <laughs> And I've spoken to a few other tabletop and uh, card game developers over the years, and one of the other more fascinating aspects, and again, one of the great challenges of this, again, is kind of getting the logistics of these games printed and manufactured. You mentioned, of course, earlier going to China, uh, visiting some of the manufacturing plants, and 
I remember, I forget who I spoke to about this, and, like, the biggest advice he said was, you have to do your research. Like, if you go into this after a successful Kickstarter and just think, I'm just going to wait until the very end to plan how I manufacture it, you're in big trouble when it comes to this. Which is, in fact, what I did with Cthulhu Wars. <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, you need, to know, you need to know ahead of time. Now, the good news is, I, I'm not saying I was smart to do that. I was not. But the good news is that there's a lot of Chinese factories now that are sniffing around looking for your business, and they will... Uh, attempt to teach you all the the ropes as as they see fit but also they're visible online and you can look around and like compare okay this guy has done game these games and usually that gives you an idea of you know that they're trustworthy and workable uh, although the recent political things in China have given me pause too so there's that um, so I've been looking into doing games. Uh, one guy's contacted me about do printing games in Portugal, and I talked to a guy last year that said he does his games in Lithuania. So maybe there's maybe China will lose its stranglehold on the board game market. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, China's been good to us so far, but uh, I guess not the Chinese government, just like our Chinese friends. Mm-hmm. I'm going back to uh, talking about like multiplayer and kind of like the number of players. When you're mm-hmm. like coming up with the design of a tabletop game, like how early in the development do you start thinking about will this be a two to four player game, five to six, and so on? It's one of the very first things that that comes out of it. When you're first visioning the game, like for example, I just recently designed a game called Invasion of the Brood, and right at the start, I said this is going to be a two player game. One player are going to be the humans on Earth, and one player are going to be the alien invaders, and that's that. Uh, when I did when I did uh, uh, Cthulhu Wars, I said it's going to be up to five players, um, minimum three, and I've since uh, added a two-player version. But yeah, I always it's always uh, a consideration from the start. Dinosaur Nightmare Forty Four is uh, four players if you're playing cooperatively. And if you're playing with two rival teams, you can go up to eight, because each team can have four. So it's it's a very early decision for me. I can't speak for other designers, but the number of players is is right there at the start. And it's, and it's hardwired in. So I was asked, can you add a sixth player to uh, Planet Apocalypse, for example? And I, and I could not, without uh, making such big changes in the game that, mm-hmm. you know, it would make me cry, and then <laughs> I would be sad. So... Mm-hmm keep from being sad I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm looking at uh, the page for Plant Apocalypse now on your site, and it looks, uh, looks very interesting in terms of, again, like, that kind of design, especially, again, like, the figurines as well. Look. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're creepy, huh? Yes, yeah, yes, they're, they they're, are. They're, the figurines are terrifying in that one. I, I, I uh, had one guy who was reviewing... Uh, he reviewed Planet Apocalypse online, and then he reviewed... Uh, Dinosaur Nightmare 44, and he said, I'm really excited about Dinosaur Nightmare 44 because although I love Planet Apocalypse, I don't want to play it with my kids because the pieces are too creepy. <laughs> I said, well, you know, it's a fair cop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're terrifying monsters in Planet Apocalypse. But I, but I, I wanted to go like, like the whole hog and have things that are genuinely disturbing for the demons. And part of that is the artist that I worked with on it, Keith Thompson, who is an amazing, amazing guy. Did uh, he do the uh, figurine art for Cthulhu Wars or something no, else? No, that was Richard Long did oh. most of the early art for Cthulhu Wars. Um, uh, but uh, Keith Thompson, Keith Thompson has he did, he's done uh, movies. You know, he works with Guillermo del Toro a lot. Um, he I don't know if you saw the movie The uh, Ritual. It takes place in I think Norway. There's a giant yeah. monster in the woods. Well, it, the monster is really weird when you see it, and it's partly because of his work. But you can see, well, if you looked at Planet Apocalypse, you can see how crazy it looks. And what I'm really happy about with it is that it has been received extremely well critically. That uh, there's lots of people that have noticed that there's not just giant creepy figures, but there's a really solid game behind it um, with features that they have not seen in other games. It's kind of part tower defense, part fighting, put together against swarms of demons. So there's, you know... So there's something that I stole totally from uh, uh, it could be, uh, digital games, the Tower Defense, because <laughs> you know that did not exist in board games. Mm-hmm. 
Now, there is one topic about tabletop games that we haven't talked about that I was thinking about I wanted to bring up with you, and that mm -hmm. is on the subject of replayability when it comes to a tabletop game. Yeah. Video games, obviously, can be it's very important, especially in today's market, with live service or games as a service as a model. And again, as we said, with frequent expansions or DLC. And I wanted to ask you, like, with the games that you've developed, I guess, how does replayability factor into a tabletop game? Well, there's two different directions you can go with this. Mm -hmm. And one is that sometimes the interactivity of the replayability is not so much that the game is different every time, but the way the players act. For example, chess has not changed for quite a while, but it's still being played, even though you could ask, say, well, how is this replayable? It's the same game every time. Well, they have found depths and levels of chess to keep it replayable. I don't know if you play poker, but is it's not the, if you do, it's not the same every time, right? Even though it's the same rules. Yeah. Texas hold them again, but you're gonna do something different. Um, so that's one way in which tabletops do it. They just like they go for depth instead of breadth. But I always go for the other way, actually. I mean, there should be there's depth in my games, but yeah, I want to have that replayability. So in Planet Apocalypse, because we were talking about it just recently, um, there's I give you 14 different heroes that all have unique abilities and unique advancement capabilities and unique flaws that hurt them. And so when you play the game with with a, a different four characters, or even three of the characters are the same, but the fourth is a different character, the game feels differently. And then there's different lords, and there's different fourth circle demons, and there's ten different maps. Each of the maps have their own challenges. And so uh, one of my games will have all these differences uh, as you play it, you know, because it's like, well, this time we're fighting against the Mandrake instead of the Hellhound, and it's a completely different experience. Plus, I'm not playing Dorothy. I'm playing Victor Steele, and he doesn't act the same way at all. And so they're feeling the game is different. And when the depth is still there, at least that's the goal, um, but, but, that's, but that's, it just makes it even more replayable, you know? Yeah. And it sounds a lot like a roguelike design, as you're describing it, that... Each play of the game, based on you know what characters you play as, what things are put onto the field, or even what map you're on, dramatically changes that play experience. Right, that's the idea. Is that so? Every time you play the game, it's like a not a whole new game. You're still you're still playing playing the Planet Apocalypse experience or the Dinosaur Forty Four experience or whatever the experience is you're trying to get. But now it's all different. So, like for example, with Cthulhu Wars. Um, one of the features of that is that each of the factions play very, very differently. So if you're playing Cthulhu, the way he does things, a strategy that works for him won't work for the yellow sign. Yellow sign has to play totally differently. So it feels very asymmetrical. That's one of my my things is make very asymmetrical games. Yeah. But then, so you're playing the game as Cthulhu and you're playing against the yellow sign and you have one experience. Then later on you play the game again and now it's the same characters but now you're playing the yellow sign suddenly you personally have a completely different experience. Yep. Because you're not able to do the things you did as Cthulhu. And you might know what Cthulhu is going to do to you because you've been him before. Mm -hmm. But you have to find out how can Yellow Sign deal with this? You know, and then of course if you then go out and buy one of the expansions and now you're going to be Windwalker from the Arctic uh, North with the freezing storms and ice monsters, then everything is different again. And, uh, you know, it just keeps on yeah. It's that changing or changing. And it really does sound like the same kind of allure and kind of that design that I like from the roguelike genre. With this idea that that's right. Each time, well, you... I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I started out in role playing games, right? So, mm -hmm. yep. And in fact, I'm doing role playing games again. I don't know if you're aware of that, but I'm. But I we re we released a couple uh, hardback books uh, called Sandy Peterson's Cthulhu Mythos. Yeah. For, one of them's for Dungeons and Dragons. One's for Pathfinder. And uh, there is, uh, and we're now we're already seeing these saga campaigns, which are hardback, full color books. Each book is four adventures in a campaign that lasts four months. So, nice. so you so over the course of the four months, you'll get this entire huge campaign with all this stuff going on. Um, so that's our. So we're. I mean, I mean, I, I'm I'm big in role playing again. Of course, role playing is endlessly. Uh, changeable because the game master can make up whatever kind of crazy world he wants, or you know whatever ad adventure he gets, and you know hopefully he will like our adventures and be able to make them into his own world. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking at the uh, page for it now on the site. It looks very impressive, especially again like the art. I think 
that's one of, I think always one of the best things about like the Lovecraft mythos. I, you can get some just amazingly like freakish art <laughs> when we talk about Lovecraft. It's true. We I mean we had a history way back when when we did Call of Cthulhu. One of the features we kind of hung our hat on from the start in 1981 was let's have really creepy good art for this. And and that's especially uh, that was a choice we made because of course Lovecraft never had illustrations for his monsters. Yeah. You know, or or very few. And and it was always he always described it as the, as like nobody they're they're indescribable they can't be drawn they can't show images so we're taking these things that are indescribably horrible and then we're making images for them constantly mm-hmm. and uh and so i i knew that uh, in peterson Gaines we had to have the same kind of let's make all these we're i mean i'm making plastic figures of cthulhu the inconceivable horror that drives a man mad just by seeing him in the book so i guess mine won't drive you mad but it's only eight <laughs> inches tall so um and then we're making the figure line for for the things for so so you can literally go and buy a Cthulhu from our figure line to have in your uh, in your role playing game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one thing that I, de- I actually I won't get to the question in chat first, and then I won't bring this one up. So uh, okay. Sharky in chat asks, what would be the basic challenges and cost behind taking a card game designed based on physical games? tweaked for video games and then turning that into a physical card game. So I guess it is a game that was kind of could have been played physically but built for digital and now he wants to take that and turn that into a physical game. So um, well I mean there's there's some examples of this online. There's a Hearthstone for example. Mm-hmm. Right? By a uh, uh, Blizzard, which is totally a card game that you play digitally. I'm sure they could turn Hearthstone into a physical card game, but some of the stuff you have, some of the ease of play that you have in in the uh, uh, digital game would go away. For example, Hearthstone keeps track of how much energy you have to to pull your cards, and you'd have to keep track of that on your own. Another good example is uh, um, uh, Slay the Spire on... uh, on Steam, where it's mm-hmm. totally a card game paradigm, you actually draw cards and you play them, and, and you spend energy on them. But again, in the in the digital game, a lot of the bookkeeping is done for you. So I guess the issue is that one of the great advantages of doing a video video game is that you don't have to do bookkeeping because that's what a computer is literally mm-hmm. designed to be able to do. It's crunch numbers. So anything that has bookkeeping is mm-hmm. better on a computer. And if you have don't have complex complex bookkeeping, if you don't have to remember lots of things, then you're fine on the uh, physical game. So I would guess that what you have to do when you're tra- taking Slay the Spire or Hearthstone or some other digital game and making it into a physical game again, is you have to either burden the player with a bunch of uh, of extra things to keep track of, or you have to simplify the game so he doesn't have to keep track of it. Yeah. And the second part was that it's being based off of Magic the Gathering with starters and boosters with about 150 different cards. Okay. I mean, Magic the Gathering is, of course, the game that uh, everyone wants to have. <laughs> um, so uh, so my buddy, uh, Richard Garfield, who did Magic the Gathering, uh, when he first tried... This is a good example of, uh, of how things were before there was crowdfunding. He took that game to... Uh, Steve Jackson and to TSR, and they turned it now flat. Nobody will buy a collectible card game, it turned out. And so he had, had to publish it on his own. And of course, then it made a, a million billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, in fact, its great service to the world is that because of the success of Magic the Gathering, there are more brick and mortar game stores than there used to be because that is probably 50 to 75 percent of their income and they're able to stay open and have board games like this because of Magic the Gathering. So thank you Mr. Garfield for (laughs) giving us that gift. (laughs) I also recall I was on a panel in uh, the late 80s um, and there was a person from Steve Jackson Games and a person from uh, 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 TSR and they were talking about, we are talking about upcoming games. And I said, oh, we're going to do this role-playing game. And both of them were doing collectible card games. And I knew that they had turned down Garfield for his game. <laughs> and I said, 
You didn't want to do his his uh, collectible game, and now you're doing doing your own. And they had the good grace to look ashamed, <laughs> but uh, it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I mean, I think Magic Gathering would be a fine game digitally. Uh, uh, I, I understand why they don't seem to be... I mean, I guess maybe they are supporting it now. I'm not sure where, the, where Magic the Gathering is in terms of its digital experience. Mm. Um, but I know they like to actually sell the cards. And, and, they have their, and they have their whole industry going on where Thursday nights it's this bout, and Friday nights you do this, and Saturday you do this, and everyone has... They have all their tournaments, and 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 a whole culture of Magic the Gathering, kind of a sports based thing, and you mm-hmm. know, yep. it's, it's impressive. I am obviously not in it because I don't even know if they have a digital version, but uh, mm-hmm. but I can I, I can sit back and salute it from a distance. Uh, I mean, every yeah. time I go to test my games at Boardwalk Games, I bring in my thing to test, and there's like two tables full of Magic the Gathering guys playing their game. So mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're quiet and. You know, don't cause trouble. I'm probably the most raucous guy there, so <laughs> maybe I'm hurting them. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, Shark also follow up with, uh, "What would be the startup cost of taking something that's kind of like Magic Gathering like and turning that to physical?" If you would know that. Oh, uh, a card game is super super cheap mm-hmm. to do. Um, what your costs are going to be in doing it is, assuming that you can design it yourself in your spare time, is hiring an artist or a layout guy to make the images and the cards. Mm -hmm. Um, And that may not be very expensive. Um, Or it might be, depending on who you hire, right? Then you simply have to find someone that can print the cards. And if it's just cards, you might be able to get away with printing it um, in America or Mexico and not having to go to to, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, um, China. But you can do a a, a deck of of unique cards with all... uh, unique designs on every card for like five bucks, you know, um, or less. So it's very inexpensive if you're doing a pure card game. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're doing, now if you have 150 cards or more, then it will be, it might be slightly more, but presumably you're not selling 150 cards in one box. You're selling them in separate boxes, and so each box has its cost. Now, there's the, the obvious thing, which I shouldn't have to, well, I'll, I'll bring it up. You, you're going to want to print a, at least a thousand copies of of uh, the game, and that's because the Chinese manufacturers, um, for reasons that I are not always clear to me, mm-hmm. their prices suddenly drop at a thousand. If you make nine hundred copies of the game, it costs like fifty percent more than if you make a thousand per copy. So, and but now they give you a further break point if you can make more. Yeah. So if you're doing, say, the game costs five bucks for you to make, well, if you're doing a thousand copies, that means you're going to have to have uh, five thousand bucks. Now that's just getting the game in your in your garage, ready to go. Hmm. Uh, this is I'm talking about a game. This whole five dollar thing is you have the cards and you have a box, and the box has art, and there's a rule book in it. Mm-hmm. And every all that's there. That's that's maybe five bucks to get that done. Um, but then you have a you have five thousand boxes in your garage that you have to figure out how to sell to distributors, and then that's where you have to like. I guess you have to start calling people on the phone and seeing if they want your game. <laughs> That's, yep. I mean, I, I mean, it was so onerous for me that I hired someone to do it full time. Oh yes, and that was one of the things I heard when I spoke with like other uh, tabletop and card game uh, makers about you know figuring out you know the logistics of how they're going to be shipped and manufactured. As you said, the the thousand uh, copy rule. I think I heard that from somebody else as well. That they want yeah, you to go in bulk. Yeah, it's weird that that's the magic number, a thousand. But I guess it's a round number, you know. Yeah. Um, I will say that uh, one place to look about some of the things here is if you go to the Peterson Games website, click on the community banner, and look for Arthur's production di- diary. He is the guy who is in charge of all of our production, and he can give you some information in and in how that works and how things cost. Now, one of the other issues is that if your game actually costs you five bucks to manufacture, you're gonna need to sell it for like twenty-five bucks. So, uh, and you may be thinking, well, Magic the Gathering doesn't cost twenty-five bucks. Well, no, it doesn't. But there's also more than a thousand copies of it printed, so its prices, price per card, is way down. Plus, they're so big now that they can kind of, uh, like, you know, twist the arms of the Chinese guys to uh, give them a better deal. But someone new doing the brand new card game from nowhere, there's they have no leverage, and so there's that. 
but you look at that now. Now, if your game is sold, there's other questions like if your game is solely going to be sold. I'm talking about financial things. That's not fun. Let's go back to games. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, sorry, I caught myself. <laughs> <laughs> I have I guess... financial people who do this these for me because I, I I prefer to do just make games and play them. <laughs> All right. I have a few more design related questions, and then I think that. I think that will probably take us to the end, at least in terms of my questions, unless anything else comes okay. up with chat or if there's anything else you want to talk about. Okay. Anyway, the too long don't read from what I just said, though, is look for Arthur's production diary on the Peterson Games website, and that will give you useful information. Also, Stonemeyer Games, Jamie of, Stone, of Stegmeyer Games, Stonemeyer Games does, uh, Jamie Stegmeyer from Stonemeyer Games does some useful uh, tips on how to do games. Okay, now, yeah. I'm, sh now I'm quiet. <laughs> All right. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to talk about, a few minutes ago you said about kind of the uh, bookkeeping side of when you're playing a tabletop game, the rules yeah. and all that. And I wanted to ask, like, from your perspective, in terms of complexity when it comes to a tabletop game, how do you approach that when you're designing these titles? Because on the digital side, as we've said, so much of the complexity and you know behind the scenes stuff is obviously handled by the game's engine. The player is not going to be experiencing that. That's right. And a digital game can be more complicated than any tabletop game. I mean, World of Warcraft is more complicated than any tabletop game has ever been or probably will ever be. The way I handle the the bookkeeping in my games is that I it's it, it's it's going to sound simple, but basically that there is a table on the game with a counter that has tracks. So to keep track of your power, you put a power marker on the track from zero to twenty, and you move it down or move it up when you get more or less power. To keep track of doom, you get a marker on the doom track and keep track of that. To keep track of what figures that you have or that you can't make, you actually have a figure pool. All this is kept on tracks. And, uh, and that's, why, that's one of the reasons my games have these little uh, faction sheets that control all your stuff. So one of my more recent games, Hyperspace, which is about conquering the galaxy, you have a track on, on your thing and it shows which technology of research by physically putting a piece on the, on the thing. There's, there's, a, there's a track for your uh, atomic production, a track for your metal production. There's things on the map that let you keep track of stuff. And so all these things are being tracked still, but instead of being tracked digitally in a computer's memory, they're physical objects that are visible to you on the map or in the places, which also helps make the game more physical. You know, I can't keep track of things as complex as a computer even so, but still, there's something kind of fun about moving your atomic production up, because mm -hmm. you've got more atomic production. I just conquered this planet, now I get more atomic. And so you get to see that go up, and it's a, it's a slightly more rewarding than uh, than having a, a number go from ten to eleven on the side of your your screen in your computer game. Hmm. And I think, as you said, another very interesting part is that when you're designing like the physicality of the tabletop game or the piece that you're going to put into it, you're also thinking about how the player is going to be experiencing or how or what it's going to represent while they're playing yes. it. Yes, I want the player to fall into the game and and lose himself in it. And that's one thing, and that kind of experience is something that, that computer games are really good at. No one thinks that when you're, when you're playing Doom, you are never thinking about the fact that you're, what you're physically doing is sitting on your butt, mo clicking the mouse finger, and moving this hand on the keyboard. You're thinking, you think of yourself as, when you describe it, you say, I shot the gun at the, at the, at the ghoul. Instead of saying, I clicked my finger on the mouse button, and then, then an animation happened, right? So, I'm tr so that's really great in a digital game, and that's what I'm trying to get in my board games. I got that from the digital thing. I want that experience. So in my game Star Captain, not published yet, I have a uh, a bridge display for the players with all the tracks of all their systems that they have for their spaceship. And they're they're working them all going up and down. So they're hopefully not thinking of the fact that what well, the physical is moving a counter up and down. They're saying, oh more power, I need more power. You know, I'll fire the blasters, that kind of thing. So it's all so I am I do spend a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, probably from my time in the digital gaming world. Mm -hmm. And again, like how we describe these mechanics and themes, that's another that's another podcast in of itself easily. <laughs> uh, well, huh? well, uh, well, let's make it sooner than another two years. <laughs> All right. You heard it here, people. You heard it for the chat. <laughs> um, one thing I want to ask you about, I'm not sure this will be a long or a short answer for you, but... I'm looking at the different tabletop games you have on your site, and one thing that I know is that 
your games typically have, in terms of the game stats, a 90-minute runtime in terms of like sitting down and be able to play through a completed title. Is that something that I guess you're consciously thinking about while you're designing the game in terms of how long an actual playthrough is going to be? When I start sitting down and designing a game, I am a little concerned about the playtime, but what happens is my technique for designing it is that I get an early version of the game up there ready to go, then I play it and I play it and I play it and I play it with different teams of people. You know, and as I do it, I'm constantly looking for things to trim off or to add on to speed up play. And in my head, 90 minutes is the sweet spot for me. Um, I mean, I have plenty of games that take longer than 90 minutes to play, and there's plenty of great games that take longer than 90 minutes to play. But uh, but that's but that's I did, I hit that with Cthulhu Wars. A four-player game of Cthulhu Wars is about 90 minutes, and. Um, uh, the God's War takes a little longer; it's about two hours for four players. So I, so I'm, I'm try. I like that 90 minute length because at 90 minutes, you can play. When you get together with your buddies to play a game, you can play two games in the night if it's 90 minutes. And if it's two hours, two and a half hours, you're only going to play one game, which might be fine. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm constantly trying to aim at 90 minutes. And I remember uh, the joy I had when, because uh, of course, there's game companies that lie about how long it takes to play a game. <laughs> One good example is Axis and Allies. Um, there's a claim on Axis and Allies 1914 that it takes three hours to play, and this sucker is like six to eight hours. It <laughs> takes forever to play. Uh, I'm not. It's a good game. It just takes a long time to play. And they didn't want to admit it on the box that it was an eight-hour game. So I had a guy doing a review of Cthulhu Wars, and he, in the, in the opening scene, he mocks me for saying it was 90 minutes. Because obviously a game with giant figures... <laughs> can't take 90 minutes to play. It's going to be like a three-hour game. Then he plays it and he, I think he took uh, like 70 minutes, 75 minutes and he goes, oh, they actually gave me the, the correct <laughs> the correct length. And I, I you know, because I, I didn't see any reason to lie about the length of the game, so um, so yeah, 90 minutes is the, is the number I'm looking for. Maybe I'm just getting too impatient as I get older. I don't want to sit there and play one game for six hours. Mm-hmm. Because if I can play an ha- hour and a half, and I lose, then I can get a rematch, and maybe I'll win that one. I have a better chance of having had a one game during that evening. Hmm. And thus I will have triumphed over my opponents. <laughs> and it's interesting to me, like, as we've had this discussion, again, how so many parallels of tabletop design really do fit the roguelike and just the rogue genre. Maybe it's because I'm writing a book on roguelike design, like my brain is just like wired into that at the moment. <laughs> Well, I mean, the thing is, game design isn't one of the like fundamental human traits that we evolved to do. It's it's a it's a like a a skill, a learned skill, I guess that mm-hmm. that everyone can do differently and apply different things to. So there's so there's lots of different ways to do designers. I often get asked, well, what do, you, do you try to do a the the basic game first, then add the weird factions? Because I always have these weird factions. I say no. I start right out with the weirdness. I uh, I don't I don't do the uh, I, I start with the theme first and then work from the theme to the gameplay, which is the opposite of what a lot of designers do. And I'm not saying that that my way is better or their way is is better. I mean, my way works for me, and uh, you know, so I never have a, like I never have a vanilla faction in any of my games that I had at the very start. It's always weird from the start. Yeah. Um, it might be take it longer to play test, so maybe it's a, a flaw on my part. But if it's so, it's a flaw I am willing to own. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, like game design, this is something that I've learned and I've talked to people about. It, it's not a you know inherent skill. It's not something you can be born with. You know, you are a master game designer. It takes a lot of time to kind of build up your own knowledge about how games work or how you want your games to work, and then be able to apply that. Yeah, I mean, when I when I designed my first game, I'd been playing games for about ten years, so I guess I had that going for me. But you're right, learning game design is a lot of it is a learned skill. I mean, you have to, you have to be creative, you have to be able to um, uh, to actually do a project and commit to it and get it finished, which is a skill that a lot of smart people don't have. Mm-hmm. And you have to uh, you have to know and care about and be obsessed with games, and then. There's all the learned stuff. Those are things that are like in your character, I guess. And then there's the learned stuff that we add into that, and that's what makes us all different and you know be unique snowflakes. Mm-hmm. 
because I've learned a lot in the course of my thing. I now know things about game design I didn't know before, and if that wasn't the case, that would be really sad. <laughs> I haven't learned anything in the last 10 years. <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to uh, continue on that you said a few minutes ago about knowing when to trim, when to add. Because I was looking at the page for where was it uh, of, of what the uh, of hyperspace I think that was the one uh, hyperspace yes about not having an upkeep phase and about like yeah. knowing like what to trim and kind of like like again like one of the major challenges of a tabletop game compared to digital is that it's up to the player to do all you know the bookkeeping you know the boring administrative stuff so to me to me, oddly enough, getting rid of the upkeep phase was a huge triumph of something new. Because mm -hmm. every game has that boring phase where you do the upkeep, right? Mm -hmm. And for the first time in a big complex strategy game, for me at least, I'd gotten rid of it. You just do whatever you want in your turn. If you <laughs> want to produce, do it. go ahead, do it. Then you don't get to move as much, you know? Uh, you want to explore, do that. Instead of having an exploration phase and a discovery phase and a, a relic creation phase, whatever it is, it's <laughs> all just on you. So I was I was really proud of that. But yeah, learn. I, I did trim things obviously from hyperspace. That's one of the things I trimmed. I trimmed entire subsystems, you know, uh, and it's really hard because uh, like, let's use hyperspace as the example. So I had an idea for interstellar markets for hyperspace very early on, where when you bought or traded atomics or metal at the market, it, their price would go up and down in terms of credits. And then a lot of the alien factions had the abilities to manipulate the market and do things. And I was really excited about this. This was my, my, my kid that I was going to put in. The game it was going to be so fun. And then the first three games we played it, and it slowed the game down so much. And everyone kept forgetting um, how the market worked, and I had to explain it again. And I said, okay, th this is my kid, and I love it, but I'm putting a bullet through its head, and it's going to go out of the game. And, um, and a lot of game designers, they have that thing where they have their favorite little... One of the differences between a pro game designer and an amateur game designer is that the amateur quite often will have his special baby that he can't bear to get rid of because it's kind of the what he's hung his hat on in the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's got to stay there, even if it's an ugly duckling that doesn't do anything. But a pro designer will be able to kill all of his kids and get rid of them. <laughs> now, every designer has a different way of doing this. My technique is I have my precious baby, like the markets, and I'll say... It does not work in this game, and I will tell myself. I will take that design out, that idea out, and I'll put it on my hard drive, and I'll say, next game, this will be a useful thing in the game, and I'll save it there. And I have games ideas I've had there for thirty years that have never worked, but I keep telling myself, <laughs> one day, one day, and that's how I can bear to take it out of my game. It's a mental trick, I guess. I guess, <laughs> and occasionally they do make it into a game. <laughs> The ever popular "Kill Your Darlings" that we've heard many, many times. Yeah, that's right. Kill, killing your daughter is is how it's got to work. It's it's hard because because the reason you became a designer is to do these cool things, and you know this thing is cool. Why can't these stupid players see it? What's wrong with them? <laughs> Why don't they see my vision? So. I just did a, a post about humility as a game developer, knowing not to <laughs> say that to people too. <laughs> Well, you don't say it to them openly. You just think <laughs> it in your head. Right? Yeah, exactly. You just keep all that to yourself. <laughs> um, let me see. I think I have just one more question, one more design-related question, then just kind of the wrap-up here. I guess our wrap-up phase here. And uh, this will, for those of you watching this, this will be officially last call for any questions for Sandy. So if you have anything, please get them in in the next minute or so. So this will, I guess, kind of be kind of apt for where we're at in this cast, but I want to ask you, with as you said, with the tabletop games you've designed, you come up with multiple expansions for them. And yeah. what I want to ask is, how do you, or do you know when it's time to move on from a project, when you can say, I'm done, you know, no more content, you know, I got everything I want in this game, let's go make something entirely new. Is your question actually if I know that? Yes, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, like, how do you get to that point would be the better question. Here's how I do it. When I have had... What, the way I check a game out and change it is that I'll play the game with the, with a group of people, and I'll watch it. Then right after playing the game, I'll go back to my computer and I'll make changes. 
and then I'll do it again, and I'll go back to my computer afterwards and make changes. Some of them make changes in the middle of the game, and everyone gets kind of irate at me and says, I just had this awesome attack! I said, yes, but your unit's too good, so now you have half the dice. <laughs> right? And, but, uh, but, but, I, but, I'll, but what happens is, when I've played the game with my testers a couple times and made zero changes, that's it. That's the magic thing. I, don't, I haven't made changes for a while. It's time to move on. This game's done. Now, sometimes I will get a, a sad uh, uh, coda onto that when someone playing online with one, I, you know, one of the online testers will say, hey, we found this huge bug in your game. Um, you suck, Sandy. And I'll go, okay, then I'll go in and I'll fix that. But typically, that's, it's as simple as that. When I've played the game a few times and not made changes, it's over. <laughs> Time to move on to the next game. That's how I did it with uh, Dinosaur 1944. That's how I did it with Invasion of the Brood. I haven't made changes for a while. I guess I'm done. <laughs> Speaking about bugs, I gotta ask you, how do bugs look like in the tabletop market? <laughs> bugs? Yeah, you say you if you found a bug with your game or a bug with an issue. Oh, <laughs> well, a bug in the tabletop market would be um, not a flaw that crashes the game. Obviously, <laughs> it would be something along the lines of, "Oh, if you do this strategy, you always win," mm -hmm. or "This strategy is is really good, but it's boring." So, for example, that's happened before, where you have some strategy where it's it's effective strategy and it can be defeated, but it's not fun. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want you to have strategies that aren't fun, so that's a bug, you know. Or like, well, if you combine these two characters together, they get a synergy, and especially when you have a game with as many uh, movable parts and buttons as one of mine, you know, there's it's possible for me to miss something where where <laughs> if you have this character and this character and they do this interaction and they're attacking this boss, suddenly they like. They get a billion hits and the guy's dead. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to that that's that would be a bug in a tabletop game. All right. um, in a co-op game, the bugs are because it's not fun. In a, a strategy game, the bug is because one player is winning, and it's not because he deserves to. It's because his faction is imbalanced in the wrong way. Yeah, and again, like there's so many parallels with digital yeah. and tabletop games, and why so many developers have said in the past of the importance of paper prototyping and being yep. able to again see these elements in play rather than just being in your head. One of the first things I do on a game is, is make that prototype. Also I will say in passing that my job primarily when I worked in the computer game industry was I wasn't a programmer. I didn't have to ever fix bugs because <laughs> right so but I did all the play testing and balance for the games. Like I'm the person that played through every level of Doom to make sure that it worked and there wasn't that you could get everything you know and I would played all the balance for Age of Empires and for Halo Wars so I'm used to doing that kind of balance pass so for me in the board games it was kind of the same thing now to a programmer it would be totally different because he's actually going there and finding his crazy code that makes no sense and carrying <laughs> out things but uh, I just had to tell them to do that when I was in computer games right. which of course they loved yep <laughs> uh, let's see Question from chat, Mr. Elrude asked, any good hacks for balancing strategy games, or I guess life hacks, beyond just play, 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 play? <laughs> um, well, the reason I'm hesitating is because every strategy game has different elements to make it, uh, uh, that you have to, that there's like a different hack for every game. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do it mathematically. I do it by feel, so I am the probably the worst person. If, if not, Reiner Kinesia was here in your board game thing, he would tell you how to mathematically analyze all the factions so that they would be exactly balanced. But but in my case, I'm doing something where, well, this guy's ability is that when um, uh, he doesn't have to build houses, and this guy's ability is that um, he has a giant monster that 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 can breathe fire. How do, I mean? How do you balance that? There's not. I mean, at one point you can claim it's all numbers, but not the same way. So I have to go. I have to go by feel. Uh, I will do it. I I will say that one thing that helps me. One hack I use in a sense is that I've been doing games so long that I can look at a thing and get an idea of what I think the game's going to be like when I do make this change. And. Um, <clears throat> And for hyperspace, I actually went a step further and I said, the fundamental um, uh, money system of hyperspace is actions. Actions are what everything is about. So I worked, so whenever I had some new ability, I said, how many actions is this ability worth? 
and I would balance it that way. So there was that. Um, um, and then you follow up with, what was the name of, could you spell the math man name <laughs> so you could look him up? <laughs> or Reiner Kniza? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Why don't we type it here in the bottom? Um, sure. He does, he's not just a math man. He just he does games that are very, that are much more analytical and uh, uh, math based than me. Uh, whereas I make these crazy uh, 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 asymmetric strategy games with giant figures. So we both. I mean, we're both. I mean, he's a great designer, and I play a lot of his games. I uh, highly recommend my favorite game. Of his is Modern Art, which is fabulous. Not only because it's super fun to play, but because it is absolutely ruthless in mocking modern art. <laughs> Great. All right. I think I am just about out of tabletop or design-related questions for you. Is there anything that we didn't touch on or anything that you're thinking about that you, you would like to discuss? If not, we can begin to wrap things up. I will say that I think games are a great development of human creativity. The range in games is so amazing from role playing games, where you're putting on some, which is crosses over into acting, to um, uh, games like modern art, which crosses over into mathematical analysis and then into then sculpture with art and uh, things that uh, that the web, the breadth of gaming is beyond that of any other. I hesitate to call gaming an art form because I don't like to think of game designers as artists but as craftsmen, but. Uh, but it is a profoundly huge thing, and it's so exciting to be in this giant renaissance of games. When I was growing up, all we had was Clue. You know, I mean, it was like 1960s. Now, there's the role-playing world that has appeared in the 70s. There's these awesome digital games that are fun to play. There's the board game revolution. There's so much stuff. The Magic the Gathering is a new thing that didn't exist before. We are in a... Uh, if you're a game player, this is the right time to be nice so I think with that that's a great word to end on but I do just to wrap things up with you I just wanted to ask for the people watching what I guess what's what are you currently working on or what's next from Pearson games um we are uh, well we, one of the things we're working on is producing the games we actually have promised like I'm sorry <laughs> 44 so they'll get into the market and people can play them um <laughs> Uh, Planet Apocalypse has done so well that we are on the verge of adding some more stuff to it because it's fun to do new demons, new heroes. Um, we're adding a hero that's kind of like uh, uh, Ash from the Evil Dead because of who doesn't love Bruce Campbell? Yep. Um, and uh, we're also doing a new role playing idea, which is, I think, a, a new thing, which is uh, a Planet Apocalypse for role playing. And of course, the concept here is that. A lot of people, there's the big bad guy in your campaign who's threatening to destroy the world, right? Or there's, or the, you already have an after the Holocaust campaign set after the nuclear war. But almost no one has it happening during that Holocaust or having the evil bad guy actually able to destroy the world. I already toyed with this in the Cthulhu Wars, which happens after you failed to stop Cthulhu. So like after Arkham Horror. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this now. Planet Apocalypse is a whole source book, 400 pages of stuff on how to destroy your campaign world. You know, like, and uh, <laughs> where hell rises up and like eats your world, and the fun and the exciting nature you have, and maybe the players can save it. Who knows, right? But whether or not they can, it's this new concept of a of a of a whole campaign which is designed to destroy itself. <laughs> nice. I think maybe maybe it'll be a giant bomb and no one will like it, but I'm super excited by the idea because I think playing in a world where the decisions you make actually matter and your world might not exist if you fail. Which is only a threat in other games; it never actually comes through. But this, it happens. So, nice. anyway, that's something I'm really excited about coming up soon. Right. And then I think I mentioned Starship Captain and some other things. I got we other there's other big secret projects which I would talk to you all about if I could, but my team gets mad at me. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they're watching you right now, going, "Don't say anything." <laughs> yeah, they're you know they're already mad at me for saying Starship Captain. Um, <laughs> I gotta ask, with your uh, wall of games, are you going to eventually have a wall of like all the figurines you have produced? Because I think that will also be. Uh, yes, I do have walls of figurines. Nice. That I produce. And uh, sadly, my camera is attached to my computer, so I can't take it to show. My wife actually made the made the cap. She made cabinets nice. with the uh, with the transparent fronts, and she puts <laughs> all the figures in there, so you can go in there and see this huge array of hideous monsters. And uh, 
and she's really proud of it and having done it, and I'm proud of her for doing it. Um, so yeah, I've got I've got the wall. So if you ever if you ever in Rockwall, Texas, drop by, I'll show you the wall of figures, and uh, you can see them. I now know what my next product's going to have to be. I'm going to need to design like just bookcases for like everywhere to hold all the games I still have physical copies of. I'll need to yeah. do that at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I when I built this house back in 1993, I insisted that it have a library with built-in shelves because I knew I was going to have to store my books somewhere. And now the games it used to be all books. Now the games have kicked out the books. <laughs> there and we go. All up here is in the bedrooms. But uh... <laughs> great. All right. Well, I think with that, I am about out of questions. Sandy, it has been a pleasure talking with you today, and best of luck with your upcoming games. And if you're interested, I, we did a roundtable discussion with adventure game designers a few months ago. Maybe we could do something with tabletop developers as well. Well, you know, uh, keep me in mind. If I'm available, you, I'll, uh, I'll... I mean, I, I'm, always, I'm always willing to, uh, to chat. All right. So, uh, with that, besides your website, Pearson Games, are there any other social media or any other like platforms you would like to plug in the castle? Oh, yeah. Um, I have a YouTube channel, which I will type into your thing. Okay. It's Sandy, uh, Sandy of Cthulhu. <laughs> um, I did not pick it. Um, so, Sandy, and, and, so, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about uh, games, and I talk about movies, and I talk about horror, and I talk about uh, science speculation. It basically, is, every week I do some new thing in that. So, like, for example, one of my early ones was How to Kill Cthulhu, where I talk about how you'd kill Cthulhu. Um, uh, the, the, the spoiler is, it's hard. Um, and uh, then I did a recent one where I talked about uh, the Italian movie genre, the giallo. Uh, actually, that one might not be out yet. Another thing, we have a, a Facebook page which I, which is extremely active for Peterson Games. So Peterson Games, Sandy of Cthulhu. I have a Twitter feed under the same name, um, but it's very. I mean, I'm on it all the time, but I say random things like I'll show a picture of my granddaughter's drawing of dinosaurs eating lollipops, things like that. So, <laughs> all right. All right. So, uh, with that, saying if you uh, when we hang, say goodbye, uh, just hang on the call for like twenty seconds. Let's have a few a quick wrap up to go over with you. But okay. uh, with that, folks, we are going to end things for our cast. So, uh, if you are new, be sure to check out our Discord and Patreon link down below. And if you are a developer in the tabletop video game. Uh, digital card game, whatever part of the industry, and you're interested in coming on to talk about design with me, please don't say to get in touch. We're always looking for new guests. Be sure to check out Pearson Games. There will be links to all his stuff in the description down below in the recorded version. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games. Sandy, again, it has been a pleasure talking with you, and best of luck, and I'm sure your fans are going to be very excited to see what you have next. Okay, take care all. All right, everyone, that's going to do it. Have a great rest of your night, and talk to everyone next time.